So now let's talk about large constants and how constants work in branches. So how do we load larger values? We've seen that the immediate field is limited to 16 bits, or from minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. But we need to be able to load larger values. We need to be able to load full 32-bit values for our 32-bit machine. The way we do this in MIPS is we combine two 16-bit immediates. So we're going to use two instructions, one that's going to load one half of this 32-bit value, the other that's going to load the other half. So the first instruction we use is load upper immediate. This is going to load the upper 16 bits of the, of the value. And then we're going to use OR immediate, which is going to load the lower 16 bits. So let's take a look at an example. Here's a constant value that I want to load. It's a 32-bit constant, so I can't use a regular immediate instruction. I'm going to load this into R2, and I'm going to start out with load upper immediate, and I'm going to load the upper half. And what this instruction is going to do is fill in the upper half of the register. It's also going to put zeros in the lower half. And this is important for when I knew the next step, which is now I'm going to do an OR immediate with the lower half. What this is going to do is it's going to replace the lower half with that value. Because it's an OR and those are zeros there, it's going to put in all the ones correctly. Now once I've done this, I've correctly got my full 32-bit constant into place. So here's a question to think about. Is the immediate sign extended for OR immediate? Remember when we looked at add immediate, we said the immediate was sign extended. But in this case, the answer is no. It's not sign extended because if it was, we'd end up oring all ones in the upper half, which would replace the values. If you look in your textbook at the reference card, it will tell you exactly which instructions have sign extension and which ones don't for the upper half of their constants. So now let's talk about addresses and branches and jumps. So we have two different types of branches and jumps. We have conditional branch instructions, which are I format. This is branch not equal and branch equal. And these have 16-bit immediates. And then we have an unconditional jump instruction, which is a J format, which has a 26-bit immediate. Problem here is addresses are 32 bits. So we need to figure out how do we get a 32-bit instruction address with these 16 and 26-bit immediate constants. The way we do this is we treat the branch instructions as relative offsets. That is, we're going to add them to our current program counter. So if I'm on instruction 8, and I have a branch not equal, and I say 100, it's going to jump 100 instructions ahead to instruction 108. We treat jump instructions as absolute values. That is, we just replace those 26 bits of the current program counter with the new 26 bits from the instruction. So let's take a look at an example. Here's a branch instruction, and we have a current 32-bit program counter. This is the address of our current instruction and we want to generate our next 32-bit program counter. To do this, we're going to take our 16-bit immediate and we're going to add it. But before we add it, we're going to sign extend it. This allows us to have negative jumps, so we can jump forwards and backwards depending on whether we have a positive or negative immediate. We're also going to be a little bit clever. We're going to shift the immediate two places over to the left. That is, we're going to multiply it by 4. And the reason we're doing this is because the program counter is a memory address, which is in bytes, but instructions are in words. So by shifting this over by two places, or multiplying it by four, we now make our offset that we're adding here in terms of instructions, not bytes. So this allows us to jump in terms of instructions, not in terms of bytes. And of course, that zero is going to be down at the bottom also, because we can't have a program counter that's unaligned, as that's an invalid instruction. Then we're also going to add four. And this is because we always add 4 when we're doing jumps. Now here's a question. How far can you jump with branch not equal or branch equal? Well, it's a 16-bit immediate offset, which allows us to go minus 32,000 to plus 32,000. And we've shifted it over by 2 bits, so it's not 32,000 bytes we can jump. It's 32,000 instructions. So this allows us to jump plus or minus 32,000 instructions. Now let's take a look at the jump instruction. So we have our current 32-bit program counter. This is the address of our current instruction. And we want to generate our next 32-bit program counter. We're going to take the 26 bits of immediate data from the J format, and we're just going to write over whatever we have for the program counter. So we're just going to replace it. We're going to take the higher parts that we don't overwrite and take those from the current program counter. And of course, the last two bits are going to be 0, because all instructions are word aligned. So this is how we go about doing this for branches. Now let's take a look at an example. 
So here's the same loop example we had earlier. We have two branches in here, and we're going to look at the first one first. This is our branch equals, which gets us out of the loop if we're done. So let's figure out how this works. So for this branch instruction, we start out at program counter value 8. That's where our program counter is 8 when we're on that instruction. We want to get to 24. So now we need to figure out what value are we going to put in the instruction to get it to 24. Well, we know we're going to add 4, as we always do that. And we know that our immediate is going to be shifted 2 bits, two bits to the left. So we need to put in a 3 here. And when the sign extended, that'll still be 3. And this is going to give us 24. So here's the equation for this. Our next program counter is the current program counter plus 4, plus 3, shifted 2 to the left. And why does this work? Well, 3 shifted 2 to the left is 8, so we end up with 8 plus 8 plus 4, which gets us to 24. Now let's take a look at the other instruction. This is the jump at the end, which is jumping from instruction 20 to instruction 8. So we want to go from instruction 20, it's our current program counter, to our new program counter of 8. And we know the high bits of that instruction are going to be just passed right through, and we know the lower bits are going to be 0, so we need to figure out what to put in the middle. And here we put 2, because again, this is going to be shifted over. So here's the equation for that, we just replace the bits, and the insight is, well, this 2 is shifted over by 2 bits, so it's going to be an 8, and when we replace those bits, we're going to get 8. So this is how you fill in those instructions. Now, when you write code, you're just going to specify a label, and the assembler is going to do all the math to figure it out for you. So why do these relative branches work? So we have this branch where we can jump plus or minus 32,000 instructions. Well, if we take a look here, this is some information over a bunch of programs, is how many bits you need to take care of branches. So what you can see here is that for most instructions, you need two to five bits of information to take care of a branch. There are very, very few instructions where you need more than 16 bits of information. So for almost all branches, we can get away with these conditional branches, which have 16 bits of information just fine. So here's a question. In this graph, you can see I've got two types of programs plotted. One is integer, int, and the other is fp. So what do int and fp mean here? Well, I kind of gave it away. Int is integer, and fp is floating point. Integer programs are things like web browsers or word processors, and floating point are more scientific programs that tend to process data and apply equations to it. So you can see different types of programs have different behavior, but for all of them, 16 bits of branching is generally enough for most branches. So what kind of branches are common? So here we're looking at a bunch of different branches, again across integer and floating point codes, and we can see at the top we have less than, greater than, greater than, less than, or equal to, and then we have equal, not equal. And what we see, like this, see from this data is that equal, not equal is by far the most common type of branch. And this is why MIPS optimizes for it. This is why we have branch equal, branch not equal instructions. And for the other options, you have to generate condition codes and branch on them separately. I'll talk about that more when you do your labs. So let's summarize now machine code and the immediates that we talked about. We have different instruction encodings to store different types of data. We saw that you can have three registers, two registers and an immediate, or just one immediate. MIPS has three different types of these, and they have different uses. The different encodings limit how much data and what type of data we can have in them, and this is all trade-off in design. What MIPS has done here is it's tried to optimize for the common case. So we saw most branches are short, so fitting in 16 bits makes a lot of sense. We also talked about how most immediates are small. Remember, if A equals B, 1, and then 2, most immediates are small and fit in 16 bits. So we optimize for that case, but we also support the general case. In the general case, we have to use two instructions to load a large constant, or we have to use a different jump instruction if we need to jump very far.